I feel like I want to talk about how religion has this tendency to bring the wrong definition of a word to that word and then insert it into it and create a text that says something other than what it actually says. So then it becomes a proof text where, for example, I heard someone who brought the wrong definition of repent to the text in the Bible and then went on and on about this verse and that verse and so forth it had the word repent or repentance and that therefore proved his circular argument of that he was making. So what he did was he took the definition of repent of basically being um, to feel sorrowful for your lack of following the Ten Commandments and start keeping the Ten Commandments. And so he quotes verse and verse and verse and verse that have the word repent. And so he's saying, see, you need to feel sorrowful for not keeping the Ten Commandments and start keeping the Ten Commandments. And over and over again, he thinks that quoting these verses because they have the word repent, which he has misdefined, proves his point, when all it does is prove the existence of a word he's defined incorrectly. And so then the meaning of the text doesn't say what it actually says, because what it really says is to change your perspective. So it says, change your perspective and believe the gospel. It says, change your perspective. And even with that, like, for example, I've seen where it'll be defined as change your mind and stop not keeping the Ten Commandments. Turn from, uh, turn from not keeping the Ten Commandments. Like, they'll even turn change your mind into change your mind about whether or not you keep the Ten Commandments. Change your mind about whether you feel sorrowful for not keeping the Ten Commandments. So they'll still get change your mind wrong, but it's... it Because it, <laughs> it's a perspective change where instead of having a value based on you are what you do and your value is how well you do it, you have a perspective where you look at yourself and others and see what God has proclaimed, the, the actual word of God, which is, this is my son or daughter and whom I am well pleased. The perspective of God that says, he's not done patting himself on the back for what he made. The perspective of God that says, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. The perspective of God that says, we see each other face to face, which means that God considers us equals. And that's completely blasphemous to most religion, is the concept that God looks us straight in the eye, and he doesn't say, no, you, you downcast your eyes. Put your, point your eyes downward, you do not look directly at me. Get down on your knees, servant. Get down. Bow down to me. God doesn't do that. God says, you're my friend. And we see eye to eye. We look face to face. We stand as equals. That's utterly blasphemous. For God to say to each and every one of us, I see you as perfectly equal in value to myself. I could hold no higher esteem for you than I hold because you are equal to me in my sight. And that's the change of perspective. That's what you're changing your mind about. Not about whether or not you comply to rules. And, well, it's a discussion, probably, that can go down its own deep rabbit hole about law and the fact that law is actually the attempt, now that you've failed to produce behavioral compliance to a social standard, now you're trying to force behavioral compliance to a social standard by making rules and threatening punishment. So, that's probably for another time. Um, but, when you bring the wrong definition of a word to the text, then all it can do, all it can ever do, is prove something that it doesn't actually say. Because you've got the wrong definition in there. So, repent is one of the most obvious and easy uh, 
illustrations of this because of how vastly different it is and how common it is to find people saying, you know, you've got to repent. But there's a lot of other definitions that run through either a filter of redefining the word by a filter of ruling by fear and ruling by force, which I talked about the filter of tyranny, of ruling by fear and by force, of despots and kings that that's how they ruled people and they claimed that their right to do so was given to them by God. And then that becomes our illustration of what kind of person we think God is. So we have obedience, meaning shut up and do what you're told or face the punishment. Instead of obedience being guide, where, where the instruction, the commandment is guidance, not here's my list of demands under threat of punishment and you need to shut up and do what you're told or face the penalty. Where what we have is we have someone instructing you and guiding you and they're offering you instructions and guidance. And then if you do the thing that you are instructed and guided to do, then that's obedience. And to not do as you are guided to do is disobedience. And then we have the penalty is not something that is assigned to you whether you follow those instructions or not. The outcome based on following or not following, the natural logical outcome can produce its own chaos or bad situations. Uh, less than ideal outcomes or better than ideal outcome, you know, better than imagined outcomes if you are obedient. So obedient doesn't mean shut up and do what you're told or I'm going to, I'm going to punish you. And that's another illustration of a word command and obedience that are run through this filter of rulers who ruled by fear and by force. But much of what is presented also gets run through a filter of legal definitions. So it's like God is this great cosmic judge and you're going to die and then you're going to stand in the courtroom accused and you either need to have an excuse that God will find you acceptable in his sight or you're going to be found guilty and thrown into the lake of fire or the second death, or eternal conscious torment, or annihilation, or whatever you want it to be. Either God tortures you, or he discards you as defective. I don't know. But none of those are valid. None of those are what God actually looks like. None of those are something that ever happens to anyone. And so, our concept of justified, and of righteous, and of judgment, is what we're going to look at. And justified is that situation that I just presented. In the legal sense, justified would mean when you are excused from guilt. So if you committed a justifiable homicide, it means you did kill somebody, but you did it, say, for in self-defense or in defense of another. That, that was something you had to do. And so you're excused from the guilt of having done what you did, because the excuse is found to be valid. The excuse is found to be acceptable. And you are declared to be excused from that. Um, some people say that justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Which um, is okay if what your understanding is that God has always seen you that way. God had never looked at you and focused on your shortcomings. He never had a grudge held against you that now that you've done whatever, um, uh, he now finds you acceptable in his sight. So it's okay if you want to use that as the definition of your understanding that what it is is I now understand that God's perspective of me is just as if I'd never sinned. If you think that it's God who changed his mind, you've got it a little twisted up. If you understand that you are the one who needs to change your mind, you are the one who needs to, quote, repent, end quote, that you are the one with the perspective change, then that's okay. But I suggest that justified 
means to be brought into alignment with the perspective of God and the Word of God, which is to look at each and every one of us and say, this is my beloved son and daughter in whom I am well pleased, which means not only are you his children, but he's pleased with you. He's still patting himself on the back at what a good job he did making you. And we're the ones that disagree with that. We think that's terrible. We think we we focus on our shortcomings and the shortcomings of others. And we say, look at all these shortcomings. You've got to be kidding me. Uh, you know, this can't be the new creation. This sucks. This is dog shit. But God's saying, no, it's very good. So you're the one, you know, that needs to come into alignment with that perspective change with coming into alignment with God. So when you change that from a legal definition, now it's not something where you're guilty and you need the right excuse to excuse you and absolve you of that guilt. You need the right excuse to make God say, you know what, I'll, I'll put the blindfold on about that one and, and I'll, I'll take that one off your account. Um, and now you've made it where I love the term mind of Christ because it just, even though it's only used, I think twice, or I think it's used twice. And once it says, uh, uh, having, I forget exactly, but even though it's got a pretty small amount of usage, I just love the term that it uh, says about having the way of thinking that God thinks having the perspective that God has, having the values that God has, seeing one another the way that God sees each of us. And God sees each of us as a treasure that is so valuable that he's willing to give everything that he has in order to obtain it. So you are the pearl of great price. You are the treasure. He's willing to sell absolutely, give absolutely everything in order to have you because you are that precious to him. That's the word of God. The, the devil says, you know, if you're, if you're the son of God, then prove it. So here, do this thing, do that thing, prove it. I don't believe that you're the son of God. God says, not only are you my son, but I'm well pleased. You're a treasure to me that I'm willing to give everything in order to have. That's the mind change. So if that's the mind change, then it's important to say that's the mind of Christ. That's, the, that's what it is. When you agree with that, that's what justified means. Okay, when you agree with that, now you're justified. Not now God has decided to pull the wool over his eyes and pretend like you never violated the Ten Commandments and never had any shortcomings and never made any mistakes. Not that God is going to now excuse you from guilt of whatever those things were, but that you are now brought into alignment with the perspective of God, with the mind of Christ with this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased applying to you and to everyone else or daughter or whatever. If you don't want to identify with it, it doesn't matter. You're his child. You are the offspring of God and he's well pleased. And so if we look at this, you know, we, we see that that's a legal definition of justification versus a definition that relates to having the mind of Christ. So if we go to Galatians chapter 2, there's actually a dispute between people that want to keep the law of Moses and add a little Jesus to their law of Moses. And that's not going to fly. So there's a dispute about what parts of the law they have to keep or not. And Paul writes, But when I saw they rock, walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as the Jews do? We who are Jews by nature, biologically, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So let's just go there. And 
if justified means to be found not guilty to be ex- or to be excused from guilt, let's put it that way. If justified is to be excused from guilt, and there's a good chance this won't even sound wrong to many people because it really is what religion presents. Knowing that a man is not excused from guilt by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be excused from guilt. Guilt of what? Of not keeping the uh, Ten Commandments, not keeping the law of Moses. That we might be excused from guilt by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. By the works of the law shall no flesh be excused from guilt. So if we substitute in the wrong definition, it might not even sound wrong. And if it doesn't sound wrong, that's because that's how much religion has taught that as the definition of what justified means. But if we think of it as being brought into the perspective of the way God sees things and the way God thinks, let's call it the mind of Christ because I like that term. Then if we put it that way, you know, let's say let's say um, the message that you are God's child and He's well pleased with you. Um, that's that's the word of God. That's the mind of Christ. So knowing that a man is not brought into alignment with the perspective of God by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be brought into alignment with the perspective of God by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be brought into alignment with the perspective of God. But if while we seek to be brought into alignment with the perspective of God by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. So we'll get to that in a second. But here you can see that by the works of the law, you cannot be brought into a change of your perspective. The way that you think, the way that you value people, whether you look at people and say, if you're the son of God, prove it. Or if you look at other people and you say, do you know your value to God? Do you know that you are, he he looks at you and sees you as his equal. That is not, that perspective can't come about by performing religious works. That perspective can't come about by performing uh works of the law you don't change your perspective that that would be an outward in working which is exactly what jesus said he said you don't make the inside of the cup clean by cleaning the outside he said you can make the outside of the of the grave look pretty but the inside is still full of rotting corpses it's disgusting inside you you can't clean the inside by by fixing up the outside and that's what is the point here is that and this relates again to the fact that law is a failure to get a certain behavior from people and so now you're threatening them with punishment so cuz this really can be oh jeez so if you have somebody that doesn't respect your property as being yours you've already failed the the law is the law is when people want to do something and now you're trying to stop them or when people don't want to do something and now you're trying to coerce them into it so now you're promising rewards and threatening punishment particularly especially threatening punishment um in order to produce a behavioral compliance that you didn't produce at any step along the way prior to that point. And so the whole point about grace is that it's going back to the root and saying, why are we waiting for the the point in time at which a person is thinking, you know, it doesn't matter that I'm hammered drunk. I need to go home and I'm going to drive there. Why are we, why are we waiting for that point to then try and get that person who's inebriated to think, oh no, this might be the penalty for me doing so. Instead of having the person who would never consider doing such a thing because they've already been brought up in the value for themselves and the value for others and the clear thinking and the soundness of mind that would prevent them from doing such a thing to begin with. 
So which is actually effective in stopping people from doing that is not having a severe enough penalty if you get caught for doing it, which then relates to... Honestly, people get caught for that because they got into an accident. And we don't want to live in the kind of society where people would get caught prior to that point. And there's... It's really... I mean, it's just a bad idea anyway. I because this really gets into the philosophy of law, and I'm real familiar with it because I've been kind of anarchist and libertarian my entire life. So I understand, like, I'm already familiar with the thinking that says, if you're making a law, you've already failed. And there's what you need before that is the education. What you need before that is the building of value and the respect building of respect for others you can't make a person respect them uh respect another person by making a rule you can you can force them to have a behavior that they re- they are required to uh perform so you can for example require that the person say thank you but you can't make them thankful And that's the difference between law and grace. How many times do you need to say thank you before you feel gratitude? Well, it doesn't work. And I don't know how many times I've actually even heard a preacher say, you know, even if you don't feel it, thank the Lord. Bullshit. Bullshit. There's no amount of times that you can, you can give a false, uh, a false gratitude that's going to produce a real gratitude. By the works of the law, by, by, by confession of a false gratitude, shall no flesh be brought into alignment with a perspective of God that actually has gratitude. So you can't, you can't be brought into the perspective of God by what you do. You can only, it's got to be an inside working outward working where something triggers you to have a difference in perspective. And I suggest even further that that's something you really can't even, you you can maybe want to do it, but you really don't even have a choice. That has to be programmed into you by others, which is why you need somebody to preach the gospel to you. This is why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And how can they know unless someone is sent? Because you need that to come from outward. It's like, I didn't believe in God, but at one point in time, I felt this overwhelming uh, amount of love that I could only describe by calling it God. And I looked at a man named Ron and I saw Jesus. So, I mean, it, it didn't come but from, uh, from another person who demonstrated to me what the message was of my own value. So it has to be, that's, that's the whole point is not to go around making a hard sales pitch to people about, you know, you better turn or burn, but to go and show kindness towards other and others so that they realize like, wait a minute, there really is such a thing as the love of God, because that's what people people don't believe in is they people believe in suffering people believe in death people believe in pain people believe in despair people believe in grief but what people don't necessarily believe in is hope what people don't necessarily believe in is kindness and if you're not demonstrating that then how are they to believe um so i (laughs) i went down a rabbit hole there um, and now it's time for another one because sinners, um, sin, the, the legal definition of sin. So here we go with more legal definitions. The legal definition of sin is non-compliance to the rules. So whatever the rules are in, in particular at the time of this writing, the, the rules were the law of Moses, but it can be whatever rules your denomination have whatever rules your society has, whatever rules your religion has, whatever rules your atheism has, whatever rules your intolerance has, it really doesn't matter. 
someone doesn't comply to those rules, you are what you do and your value is based on how well you do it. So the legal definition of sin is when you, you're not keeping the rules. Um, and that's, that's to simplify that. But what sin really is, is that it's a focus on shortcomings. So the legal definition is that you have shortcomings. The grace definition is that you focus on shortcomings. The legal definition says that sin is to miss the mark. The grace definition says there's a mark. Why did you set up a mark? Why are you judging people on based on, on whether they hit a mark? Where did this mark come from? Where did you invent that? Who told you there was a mark? Um, and so... If we look at the in the garden, Adam and Eve were um, so so the story of that is that there's a deceitful voice, which is the serpent, and the deceitful voice says there's something you have to do to find yourself acceptable to God, and so to eat that fruit that that's the the fruit is the fruit is that word that deceitful word um, to eat that fruit is to accept that and say there must be something that I need to do in order for God to find me acceptable. And so now what that's done is that what that really says is, is you have a shortcoming and here's what you need to do to cover that shortcoming. And so that's the covering of the fig leaves is, is fig leaves are the religious works. The fig leaves are the attempts to cover the shortcoming. So sin was the identification that it says they were naked and they were not ashamed. And then it says their eyes were opened and they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. So naked is a shortcoming. Naked is a vulnerability. Naked is something that could be perceived as as causing you to be less than ideal. So it's it's easiest to think of it as a vulnerability or shortcoming is what nakedness means. Nakedness is the exposure. Nakedness is the vulnerability. So what happened was they had vulnerabilities. They had shortcomings. And religion hates that idea. They had shortcomings. They were not magically perfect human beings that could breathe underwater and fly through the sky and nothing ever died. They had shortcomings, but they had no focus focus on those shortcomings that caused them to think like, you know, this is a problem. And so they had shortcomings, but they were not ashamed of them. Then their eyes were opened after receiving this deceitful word, after hearing that they had shortcomings and there was something they needed to do to cover those shortcomings. Now they had a focus on their shortcomings and they were ashamed and they were afraid of God, which is exactly what religion does to you. It says, here's your shortcomings. God doesn't like you the way you are. And it makes you ashamed and it makes you focus on your shortcomings. So if nakedness is your shortcomings and sin is a focus on shortcomings. We look at a, in Noah, uh, his one son came in and he said, hey, dad's drunk and passed out naked and broadcast that. And the other two sons said, you don't know what you're talking about and neither do we. Um, and so what happened was religion even doesn't see this as wrong because religion is so focused on pointing out your shortcomings that it doesn't think that really the problem, the thing that he did wrong was that he said, Hey, dad's drunk and passed out naked in the tent. That was it. That was the thing he did wrong. And so it invents something else that he did wrong. And religion has this obsession with putting sex into things where it's not there because sex is wrong. Even though, the first commandment was be fruitful and multiply. Um, but anyway, so it invents this disgusting idea that what he did was he went in and he did stuff with his father. Um, and that's what he did wrong. No, what he did wrong was that he said, dad's passed out drunk and naked. That was it. That was the thing he did wrong. He focused on shortcomings. He exposed his nakedness. So what the other sons did was they said, we refuse to acknowledge this. We refuse to acknowledge the shortcomings. We will not live that way in focusing on someone's uh, vulnerability. So what they did, and it's important because what they did involved a willful, deliberate uh, uh, 
act that said that was one of absolutely deliberately forcibly consciously making an effort to not look upon whether whether that report was accurate or not so they walked in backwards they refused to look upon maybe he was fully clothed maybe he was just asleep and not passed out maybe he wasn't drunk they refused to acknowledge it they would have no part in that they walked in backwards and they dragged a blanket upon, uh, across him and they came back out they had no idea what the situation was the only report they had of what the situation was came from the other brother the one who focused on and broadcast the vulnerabilities they refused to look on that that would be like if someone came to me and said you know Debbie's, De- Debbie is a heroin junkie and I would say you know you don't know anything about that and neither do I so you know why don't you go do something else why don't you go talk about something else why don't you maybe, you, maybe you've even got your own problems you could deal with instead don't worry about Debbie um, you know it's a willful refusal to look upon people's shortcomings I think that's what Paul meant when he said, I, I refuse to know any, I, I don't remember the wording, but I refuse to know anything except Christ and him crucified. He was actually saying that to the people he was writing to. He, he was saying, I refuse to acknowledge anything about you. I'm not going to look at your shortcomings, but I'm just going to focus on this message here, which is the one of Christ and him crucified. But anyway, so when it's, when we see this contrast of what sin is, sin in the legal definition is non-compliance to the law of Moses, non-compliance to the law of your denomination, non-compliance to whatever rules. But sin, according to grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, is to focus on shortcomings. Sin is to miss the mark, but sin by grace is to have a mark that you can miss. And that's really, that's the thing that religion hates is to say the answer is not to keep practicing until you get better and better at hitting the mark. The answer is to take down the goddamn target and throw it the fuck out. So again, we get back to the process, the problem that law is an attempt once the system has already failed to produce a behavioral compliance. And it says, if we seek to be justified by Christ, and we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. Now he's allowing himself to use the legal definition here. He's saying, if we seek to be justified by Christ, and we also ourselves are found to have shortcomings, to have missed the mark, to have not complied to the law of Moses, is therefore Christ the minister of non-compliance to the law of Moses. God forbid. Why? He's talking about a dispute where this whole thing is talking about a dispute he has with people who are saying, you need to keep the law of Moses. And he says, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I go back under this law, I'm, all I'm going to do is see shortcomings again. I'm going to go back under this system where my fixation is on shortcomings and on keeping these rules. And that's what, you know, I'm going to be an actual sinner because I'm going to focus on shortcomings. Not I'm going to be a sinner because I'm not complying to the rules, but I'm going to be fixated on judging myself and others based on shortcomings, based on exposing of nakedness. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I'm dead to the law. I'm not going to rebuild it. I'm not going to resurrect the law. Christ is resurrected, not the law. The law was buried in the ground. Christ resurrected, not the law. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So now we get to our next word that we're going to look at, which is righteousness. Because the religious definition, the legal definition of righteousness is to be made right before God, acceptable, approved, declared innocent. It sounds a lot like the legal definition of justified to be excused from guilt. So justified legally is to be excused from guilt. Righteous legally is to be made right for before right before God and acceptable in his sight, it's a lot similar. But what justified is, is to be brought into alignment with the perspective of God. And just as similar, righteousness 
actual righteousness by grace is to uphold people in their weakness and to support people in their need and to give kindness and protection and, and protection to others in need. So real righteousness is not about, and this is the other definition of righteousness that in, in the religious sense is that it's compliance to the law of Moses or what law of denomination or to religious works. It, it, it all kind of blends together as meaning the same thing. So whatever the demands of your denomination are, that the religious compliance to that is what they call righteousness. So they'll say that it's tithing and Bible study attendance and prayer time and not associating with people not from our denomination. That it's, you know, those sorts of things are what religion says righteousness is. So it says it's, it's justification is to be found acceptable before God and it's justification by means of these religious works of tithing and not associating with people that are part of another denomination or not part of your denomination or whatever. Um, so it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And so we see that if, if being made acceptable before God is the definition that we use, if being made right before God, it says, if being made right before God comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Well, that produces uh, the perspective that God needs, God doesn't find you right before him. He doesn't find you acceptable. And there's something that you need to do in order to change his mind. But if that's the case, then Christ is dead in vain. Because if righteousness come by the law, means meaning something that you do, then Christ is dead in vain. So what is it that you do that changes God's mind. What is it that you do that makes God repent and change his mind? Was was the was the message uh get God to change his mind and believe the gospel? I mean that's how religion religion perverts it into get God to change his perspective about you by believing our con by making a confession of of faith and uh, being baptized in water and whatever other 12 steps we have for you. Uh, or even just that, you know, it's a confession of the creeds or something like that. Uh, get God to change his mind about you by confessing the creeds. Um, if it's something you do, then that's the work of the law. And so here it is, it's saying that it's righteousness is not to be made right before God as though God needed to change his mind about you. As though God found you unacceptable in his sight and there's something you need to do in order to change his perspective and cause him to feel as though you're acceptable in his sight. And that's the satanic concept that religion promotes of justification is God finds you unacceptable and if you do this thing, then he'll pull the wool over his own eyes and they, they call it positional justification which really, and I guarantee somebody's going to hear this and, and thank God. Um, it means God pretends that he likes you. That's, let's just put it simple. Positional justification is the satanic doctrine that God doesn't like you, but he pretends to. Um, and that's really what that is. But that's not what justification is. Justification is when you put on the mind of Christ, when you change your perspective and the righteousness uh, the righteous righteousness is to uphold people in their weakness and to support them in their time of need so can can this mind frame where you do these things out of the goodness out of the out of the mind of Christ come by the law no because we already went through that that there's no amount of saying thank you that's going to make you feel grateful you cannot produce a heart change from a behavioral change. You need you produce a behavioral change from a heart change. The system is backwards. It tries to say, here's the threat of penalty and the promise of reward if, uh, for changing your behavior. And all that can ever do at most is change your behavior, but it cannot change your heart. It cannot change 
how you feel and how you think and the perspective that you have of the world. It just doesn't work that way. That has to come from inside. It has to be an inward out working, which is why the seed needs to be planted in your heart and then it'll sprout up. And it needs to be like, so the parable of the sower is the parable of the sower. And I get so irritated hearing people say like, I just want to be the good soil. Go stand out on the road and say, hey, you want to be fertile soil or pavement? That's how stupid that concept is. It's the parable of the sower. Why are you sowing seed on stony ground? Why didn't you plow it? You know, why, why aren't you watering these things? Why is it drying up? Why are you not intervening? Why aren't you being a farmer? Like, it's the parable of the sower. The soil doesn't choose what kind of soil it is. That's the point. The whole point is that if you're going to be the sower, you need to check what kind of ground you're throwing the seed on. You might need to till it. You might need to burn away the thorns. You might need to do something about it before you sow the seed. You might need to perform some maintenance after you sow the seed. You can't just go throw the stuff around, scatter shot, and be like, ah, see you later. But that's exactly what evangelism does. Let's go scatter some seed on pavement and see what grows. Oh, you know, that reprobate pavement that won't produce any growth. <sighs> All right, I think I got sidetracked. <laughs> so now we're at righteousness. And <sighs> righteousness is not religious works. Righteousness is not defined by not associating people not from our denomination. So let's do more substitution. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 1. Thus says the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Ooh, man, we're loaded with all kinds of words that have the wrong definition that religion sticks in there. So let's just read it the way religion reads it. Okay, so we got judgment is to administer a penalty Justice, according to religion, is to return harm for harm. Salvation is to uh, prevent you from having to die and go to hell. And righteousness is religious works not associating with people not from our denomination. So let's see if I can keep that all straight. Thus says the Lord, administer penalties and return harm for harm. For my ability to not have to die and go to hell is near to come, and my... Adherence to religious works and not associating with people not from our denomination is to be revealed. That is a mouthful. That's not what it says. That's all kinds of stuff being inserted into the text that isn't there. That's all kinds of defining words incorrectly and expecting it to say anything meaningful after having distorted the meanings of every word. But now let's put good definitions in there keep judgment that's going to be have mercy and compassion and help the needy so have mercy and compassion and help the needy and do justice justice is restoration so to restore somebody from their previous state of not not having things going right have mercy and compassion help the needy restore people for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. So salvation is healing, it's restoration, it's... It's got zero to do with how God treats you after you're dead. It has zero to do. Zero people are in need of protection against what God plans to do with them after they die. So that's not what salvation is. And even within the context it's it's talking about salvation is deliverance from your situation salvation is salvation is healing from your illness salvation is release from your captivity salvation is comfort from your grief salvation is getting out of an addiction salvation is when you realize you're not a filthy disgusting depraved worm reprobate sinner and that you're the son of God in whom he is well pleased. That's what salvation is. Um, 
So his righteousness to be revealed, well, that's upholding people in their weakness, supporting them in their time of need. So what does it say? It says, it says, have mercy and compassion, help the needy, restore people. For my deliverance from the situations that you're in is near to come. And my strengthening you in your time of weakness is to be revealed. We go to Jeremiah chapter 24, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Well, that's part, that's the first, the first thing is that you understand and know God. So that's something to ponder right there. Glory in the fact that you understand and know God. That must mean that you, you are in alignment with the perspective God has. That I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and the righteousness and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Let him that glor- let's substitute. Let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, administration of penalties, and not associating with people not from our denomination, and tithing and Bible study attendance. In the earth, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. Or let, that doesn't seem like that could be the right definition of righteous. Um, let him that glories in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, administration of penalties, and finding myself acceptable in my own sight. That's like, I'm having trouble here. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Um, okay, let's turn it around. Maybe, maybe it's finding you acceptable. Okay, so let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, administration of penalties, and finding you to be acceptable in my sight, in the earth, for in these things I delight. Or maybe, maybe it says... But let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Or that we could say that he is in alignment with my perspective. That I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, mercy and compassion, and help for those in need, and strengthening in weakness, and upholding people in their time of need. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. That would be a very different message. That doesn't sound anything like what you hear in many religious establishments. Jeremiah 22, chapter 3. Thus says the Lord, Execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. So let's do some substitution. And we've got, here we go, here's judgment. Thus says the Lord, Administer penalties, and do not associate with people not from our denomination. And deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong. Do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. That seems kind of confusing. That doesn't... What does administering penalties have to do with do no violence to the stranger? Maybe it says something different. Maybe it says, thus says the Lord, have mercy and compassion. Help the needy, uphold people in their time of need, support them in their weakness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor and do no wrong. Do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. That could be. We go to John chapter 7, and this is great because now we have a term called righteous judgment. So what is righteous judgment? And... Let's just take a look at this because Jesus has just healed somebody and they're saying, you've done something wrong because you healed on the Sabbath. And there's one place even where they say, you know, they, they basically say like, look, you've got six days a week to do this crap. You know, don't do it on Saturday. <laughs> so Jesus 
contrasts their devotion to a tradition of men and to a religious uh, a religious law. So this ties in with the idea of a hypocrite being a person who elevates religious works and religious tradition and religious rituals above actual kindness towards others. So he says, if a man on the Sabbath day receives genital mutilation so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Because let's, let's even break this down before we get to verse 24. Because he's saying, your religious mindset says that there's no wrong time to mutilate somebody's body. But that Saturday, don't heal. Don't heal people and make them whole on Saturday. There's no wrong time to snip the tip. But there is a wrong time to heal somebody. There's no wrong time to adhere to this religious tradition, but there is a wrong time to help somebody. He's saying that's a very confused way of looking at the world. So keep that in mind as we continue to discuss this topic, because that's really the breakdown of it, is that elevating these religious traditions and these religious works above healing people. And it's just so profound that he said to them, you don't think there's any wrong time to snip the tip, but you do think that there's a wrong time to heal somebody? He said, it's never outside the will of God to help somebody. It's never against God to heal somebody. God is never going to be angered that you've done something in kindness for someone. And that goes against that that even just that that rubs up against so much that I've heard from religion that says like, you know, your acts of kindness don't count unless you've made this confession of adherence to our creed. Like, God doesn't count that, even though Jesus said, if you gave even just a, a cup of water to one of these ones, you've done so to me. Did he say, uh, provided that you've made confession to the right creed, then I'll count it? No. He, in fact, that whole passage is a criticism of people wouldn't do anything unless they thought they were going to get some reward for it. You know, they they were only... He was contrasting the people that were moved by compassion with the people that were moved by promise of reward. Um, not people that made a confession to a creed versus people that didn't make a confession to that creed. Um, so now he gets to verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So whatever righteous judgment is... The word but is there, which tells you that we're talking about a contradiction. We're talking about juxtaposing things. We're talking about a contrast, something that is the opposite of another. So judge not according to the appearance, and the opposite of that would be righteous judgment. Hmm. So if you look at somebody's behavior, that would be the appearance. And then if you judge their value based on you are what you do, and I value you based on how well you do it. That would be judged according to the appearance, and that would be the opposite of righteous judgment. So what would righteous judgment be? Well, if judgment is to administer a penalty, and righteousness is not associating with people not from our denomination, then righteous judgment would be to administer a penalty to people that are not from our denomination. It would be to administer a penalty that didn't to people that didn't confess the creed the way we do. But that would be judging according to the appearance. So that can't be what righteous judgment is. So maybe judgment is to have mercy and compassion and help the needy. And maybe righteous means to uphold people in their weakness and support them in their time of need. So maybe it says, don't judge people based on how well they do, that 
don't judge people as you are what you do and, and your value is how well you do it. Don't judge according to their appearance. Don't judge according to the outcome. Don't judge according to how things look or what their compliance to the law of Moses is. But uphold people in their weakness. Support them in their time of need. Have mercy and compassion and help the needy. That's probably what he was expressing there. Especially since they were saying, you know, don't heal on Saturday. And he was saying, you do religious works on Saturday. Why can't you heal people on Saturday? That's never... God's never angry that you've healed somebody. God's not going to say... God, God would never say, you know, you got six days a week to do that. Don't, don't do that on Saturday. If you were to say, don't do that on Saturday, it would probably be something like genital mutilation. That, that would be, you know, maybe we could even consider whether God ever actually commanded genital mutilation. That's another, that's another discussion for another time. So we go to Isaiah chapter 30, verses 18 and 19. It says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto you at the voice of your cry. Then shall you hear it, and he will answer you. So let's look at, there's a few other words in here that we've got to look at. The religious definition, the legal definition of grace is unmerited favor. And the legal definition of mercy is to withhold a penalty. So if we put those typical religious definitions in there and use the typical religious definitions here, it says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may give you favor that he doesn't think you ought to have. And therefore will he be exalted that he may withhold a penalty upon you, for the Lord is a God of administering penalties. Well, right there, that's even a little confusing. That he's gonna he's going to give you what he doesn't think you ought to have and withhold a penalty because God is a God of assigning penalties. Blessed are they that wait for him, for the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, and you shall weep no more. He will be very giving of things that he doesn't really want you to have unto you at the voice of your cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer you. So what grace and mercy really are is that Grace has nothing to do with God doesn't think that you really ought to have it. Grace is kindness and compassion and help, and so is mercy. They're, they're basically comfort the grieving, strengthen the weak, help each other out, help the needy. And actually, both words, there's really no distinction between the two. They're They're very much more synonymous than typically you hear people will say like grace is getting what you don't deserve and mercy is not getting what you do deserve when they're really both the same word they're both another way of saying to give somebody the strength that they don't have to give somebody the protection they don't have to give someone comfort in their grief to treat them with kindness and both words are are actually the words like in in French you say thank you by saying merci which is mercy and in Spanish you say gracias which is grace so they both mean thank you in in respective languages uh which just goes to further illustrate that they're essentially synonymous with one another so they both have to do with gratitude which that word is the same word as grace same root um and being merciful, which is another, you know, so you see these words, they're basically all have to do with having kindness. They both basically have to do with having the ability to encourage and build up and restore people. And that's what all these words really have to do with, with whether it's righteousness, whether it's judgment, whether it's justice, whether it's salvation, whether it's grace, or whether it's mercy. And so... What it's really saying here is, and therefore will the Lord wait that he may be strength in your weakness to you. And therefore will it be exalted that he may be 
comfort in your grief upon you. For the Lord is a God of mercy and compassion and help to those in need. For the Lord is a oh, for the Lord is a God of judgment. For the Lord is a God of compassion and help for those in need. Blessed are they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very kind in your time of need unto you at the voice of your cry when he shall hear it and he will answer you. So that's deliverance. That's saying you've got a situation that you need help out of and I'm going to give you that help out of it. That's what gracious is. That's what merciful is. That's what judgment is. That's what justice is. That's what salvation is. So now we get to Zechariah 7, 9, and this is where I get my definition of true judgment, where I've said, show mercy and compassion and help the needy. Because in Zechariah chapter 7, 9, it says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. If we use the religious definitions, this is a really confusing verse if we do substitution. Because then it says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute administration of a penalty and show withholding of a penalty and compassion every man to his brother. Which one? Do I administer the penalty or withhold it? I'm not sure. Maybe I've defined the words wrong. Maybe it should say something more like execute true judgment by which we define it as show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. So that's what I think this is. is This is defining the word judgment by saying and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. Then further expanding on, on it by saying... You know, take care of those who are widows. Take care of the orphans. Take care of those who are not, you know, the the strangers, the the not the lo- the people that aren't local. You know, the people that aren't from that area. The people that have imported one way or another. Help those who are poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. So evil is harm. So don't imagine harming somebody. Don't imagine harming the stranger, for example. Don't imagine harming somebody else in your heart. That's what true judgment is. So if judgment was to assign a penalty and that justice would be to return harm for harm, then that would be to imagine evil against a, your brother in his heart, uh, against your brother in your heart. But he's saying, don't do that. This, this is the opposite of true judgment. True judgment is to show mercy and compassion. So is true judgment to withhold a penalty? I mean, we all hear God is just and he can't just forgive sin because that would be an injustice. Well, then if withholding a penalty is an injustice, then how can true judgment be to withhold a penalty? What penalty? For doing what? You know, God doesn't see you based on your shortcomings. That's the whole point. You're naked, but there's nothing to be ashamed of. The whole point is take down the target. It doesn't belong there. Stop working to get better at hitting the target. So now we go to Matthew chapter 23, 23. And he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides restrain in that and swallow a cam- camel. So... Mm. We got a whole bunch of things here. The scribes are the people who would teach and write down the traditions and the, the writings, and they would teach them because most people weren't literate, and they would pass the literacy and the proper presentation of what is what is written. That's something to, to get back to, too, is um, the fact that this was an oral tradition, even though it was written down, that... I suspect what was written down was more or less notes that reminded you of what it was that you taught. And the Pharisees are a group, a, a sect of the Judaism, 
of Judaism of uh, that derived itself from an integration of Zoroastrianism. The people who practice Zoroastrianism are called Parsis. And the word Pharez means uh, a breach. And so what they did, what they were, they were separatists, which is what Pharisee means. So, ooh, hey, look, not associating with people not from our denomination. So they believed in not associating with people who were not Pharisees. They were separatists. And we discussed hypocrites. Hypocrite is to elevate religious works and uh, the practice of religious traditions and rituals above actual kindness for uh, fellow human beings. So here, oh, look, hey, they paid their tithe, but they don't admit the, but they don't perform the weightier matters of the law. In other words, the things that actually mattered, the things that were actually important, which is judgment, mercy, and faith, which is, uh, let's see, that's administering penalties, withholding penalties, and confession of a creed. Ooh. No, I don't think that's what it says. I think it says the weightier matters of the law are to have mercy and compassion and help the needy, to comfort people in their grief, and to have faith in one another. These ought you to have done and not leave the other undone. You blind guides restrained in a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them will be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are unto, like, unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so... You also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So you're like producing this religious righteousness, tithing, Bible study attendance, prayer time, not associating with people from outside your denomination. You outwardly appear righteous, but inside, you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Why? Because you've elevated religious works among, above actual acts of kindness. You've elevated religious works like genital mutilation and paying tithes over helping the needy, over faith towards one another, over having faith in one another. And you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Well, what's iniquity? Iniquity is inequality. Iniquity is the logical outcome that when you value people based on their performance and you say to them, you are what you do and your value to me is how well you do it, well then, everyone does it on a different scale. Therefore, it must be that how well you do it causes you to be of unequal value. Since you're of unequal value, well then, that's iniquity. But when your value is this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. When your valuation is that God says, you're not my servant, you're my friend. And we see eye to eye, face to face. I don't force you to downcast your eyes. You're not here to serve me, I'm here to serve you. So, share that. Know that. Accept that. Come into alignment with that. Come into alignment with my perspective. And when you do, you will uphold others in their weakness. You will support them in their time of need and give them kindness and protection. And you will have mercy and compassion and help the needy. And that will be justified, righteous judgment.